golden eggs. Uh huh. And that's what Churchill said. Okay. okay. April 20th, 1940. We've all heard the expression, haste makes waste. But when the haste is largely unplanned armed expeditions to combat an unforeseen invasion, the waste can be measured in human lives. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, Germany invaded Norway, and by the end of the week, had taken all major Norwegian ports, though at sea, the German Navy had not fared well against the British. The Allies are already landing forces of their own in Norway this week. Max Hastings has this to say about those landings. The makeshift Anglo-French landing forces sent to Norway defied parody. Almost every effective unit of the British Army was deployed in France. Only 12 half-trained territorial battalions were available to cross the North Sea. These were dispatched piecemeal to pursue objectives that changed almost hourly. They lacked maps, transport, and radios to communicate with each other, far less with London. Imagine how we felt when we saw a towering ice-capped mountain in front of us. We South London boys. We had never seen a mountain before. Most of us had never been to sea. I mentioned in February that German General Niklaus von Falkenhorst had planned the Norway invasion with Baedeker tourist maps, right? Well, he is not alone. Since both sides are pretty surprised to find themselves fighting in Norway, both sides get a lot of their battlefield intelligence from Baedeker tourist guides. Both sides' intelligence services are hard at work, though, in the Norwegian campaign. The Germans can read around a third of the British naval signals in the North Sea, and thus can find and attack many ships they would otherwise have missed. As for the British, well, starting this week on the 15th, the Government Cipher and Signals School, which is at Bletchley Park, breaks the Enigma key used by both the Luftwaffe and the German army during the Norwegian invasion. We've talked before about Enigma. It's the rotary encoding machine used by the Germans. Now, the key used here is relatively uncomplicated. And there are loads of messages sent through Enigma and received at Bletchley, and some of them take under an hour to decrypt. This is a ton of information on pretty much everything. Organization, supply, invasion plans and intentions. Winston Churchill will later call these golden eggs. But here's the thing, British intelligence is not yet at all prepared to make use of the information. They have no secure way of getting it to the army and navy commanders in the field. They can't even really explain the nature of the source of their insight. They don't have a collating and distribution process. And so, as Martin Gilbert succinctly puts it, the breaking of the Norway Enigma key, a triumph of cryptography, thus had no influence on the course of the Norwegian campaign. Now, since all campaigns eventually have an end, it's not really a spoiler to say that this one will too, whenever that may be. So he continues, With the ending of the campaign, its use by the Germans was to be discontinued. In the intelligence war, Germany, not Britain, had been the victors in Norway. As for the action in the field, at the end of last week, the Germans pushed out from Oslo east, north, and west. They now have some quick successes, forcing some Norwegians to surrender and others to cross into Sweden. But Norwegian General Otto Ruge is pretty well positioned between Ransfjord and Lake Mjosa to take on the German force heading for him. And the Luftwaffe is mostly grounded until the 17th by weather. But after that, with a panzer battalion, the Germans take ground both east and west of the lake. Ruge's basic plan is to stop the Germans in the passes leading from Oslo long enough for the British to arrive in force. But if the Germans can make their way up Gudbrandsdal, the Allies landing this week at Ondalsnes to move on Trondheim would be threatened from the rear. On the 14th come small British landings at Namsos and Harstad. The Allies are thinking of what to do to free Trondheim and Narvik, but they will rule out direct assault. Instead, they will build up from the landings at Namsos, Harstad and Ondalsnes. The weather is causing some serious hassles, though. At Namsos, there's four feet of snow and no possible cover from any air attacks. And the British force that was to try and land at Olesund is held back all week by the weather. Still, the main body of the British 24th Guards arrives in Harstad on the 16th. The 146th Brigade lands at Namsos. On the 17th, the British begin to land at Andalsnes. With the landings, 
you can see that Hitler's orders now reflect uncertainty. On the 17th, he sends out the order to his men in Norway to hold out as long as possible. The next day, the British 148th Brigade lands at Andalsnes. Now, when they land there, Ruge demands, does not ask, demands for them to not move on Trondheim as planned, but help consolidate the Norwegian lines just south of Lillehammer. However, the British troops were poorly equipped and trained, and were not helped much by the hurried loading of their transport ships, which meant vital supplies and weapons were either missing or left behind. Another quote from World War II Day by Day by Donald Somerville helps illustrate that further. During the night, part of the 5th Demi Brigade Chasseurs Alpins lands at Namsos. There has, however, been a mistake made with the equipment for this force, and they lack some of the bindings necessary for their skis. This sort of elementary error is typical of the muddled way the whole Norwegian campaign has been conducted and will go on being conducted on the Allied side. By the 19th, the 146, which has advanced to Steinkjer, is forced to retreat to Namsos. Side note here. The Anglo-French forces at Namsos are under the command of acting Major General Carton de Viart, whom you'll hear more about next week. Anyhow, at the end of the first week of Allied landings, the Germans have complete air superiority and heavily bomb Namsos. There is no natural cover, as I said. Meanwhile, the Germans advancing from Oslo reach Lillehammer and Rienna. As for the administration of the conquered territory, this is the quizzling situation. Germany's ambassador to Norway, Kurt Brower, is maneuvering Vidkun Quisling from power only a few days after Quisling set up a new government. Adolf Hitler has written to Quisling thanking him for his service and promising him some sort of position in the new governing commission. But that's not the same thing as being prime minister of a new Norwegian government. On the 15th, power is officially transferred from the Quisling cabinet to an administrative council of seven men that Hitler hopes will be able to work with Norway's King Haakon. The council is actually established by members of Norway's Supreme Court and is chaired by Ingolf Christensen. At this point, to the world at large, Quisling is known as both a traitor and a failure. The occupation of Norway is just beginning, but there's news this week from an occupation now well over two years old. The Chinese Winter Offensive had shown that China's armed forces could do the occupying Japanese some real damage. And indeed, the Chinese are still harassing the Japanese with guerrilla attacks in the Shangxi Hebei region. Japanese General Tada Toshi has built moats and walls alongside the railway there, and even European style concrete pillboxes to try and protect it. But this still doesn't do the job. So this month, the first Japanese army orders are. Destroy enemy forces throughout southern Shangxi province and paralyze their activities at the sources, thus crippling Chang's government and at the same time extending the Japanese occupied area in order to expedite the creation of a peaceful and orderly North China. Now on the 17th, the Japanese attack the north bank of the Yellow River at Monan. They face stiff resistance, but next week will capture Jin Chang. And this week comes to an end, and as it does on April 20th, Adolf Hitler turns 51, making him the same age I am, and his mood turns as well. He is not only elated by success, he orders a new SS regiment created to be called Nordland and to be made up of Germans, Danes, and Norwegians. He has reason to be elated for the time being, for his invasion of Norway is so far a great success as his forces advance, battering both the Norwegian defenders and the Anglo-French new arrivals. Something I read in Max Hastings' All Hell Let Loose shows the general reaction of the locals to invasion. The Norwegians displayed implacable hostility to their invaders. Even when compelled to acknowledge subjugation, they were unimpressed by explanations. Ruth Meyer, an Austrian Jew who had escaped the Nazis to Norway but who will die in the gas chamber at Auschwitz two years from now, writes in her diary of watching some German soldiers telling the Oslo locals that the Poles had killed 60,000 German civilians in Poland before Germany invaded Poland to protect the rest of them. A Norwegian local asked the soldiers if they really believe that they're in Norway to protect the Norwegians. As it now says in the local papers, the soldiers say that they are, in fact, there to protect the Norwegians from the British. And this they do believe. 
We've talked in both this series and in Between Two Wars and War Against Humanity about the stunning effect of total propaganda. That, to the world at large, the German invasion of Poland was a dastardly act of unwarranted aggression. But to the average German civilian, it was justified or even necessary because the Poles were killing all the ethnic Germans in Poland and planning to invade Germany. I mean, that's what the papers and the radio had been telling them every single day all last summer. I mean, they wouldn't lie about that, right? Why would anyone make that up? If you want to see more about the broadcast and control of information in the 20th century, check out our Between Two Wars episode about the explosion of the radio age right here. Our Patreon supporter of the week is James Sinnott. James and our other patrons provide us with the cash to finance all of the Time Ghost productions. So please consider also supporting us if you don't already at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time. Mm -hmm.